Hey everybody, welcome back as we continue our study of Genesis. I apologize for the format that this has to come in. Uh, Pastor Steve Vicker and myself, we are up in Daytona right now, and so we're at a pastor's conference, but we wanted to be able to have you come together, be able to study God's Word. So I'm going to do my absolute best to keep this to about 40 minutes uh, for the Tuesday morning group, but also for the Wednesday group so that you can get out a little bit early or you can spend time um, in discussion or however you want to do that. But as we do, um, as we always do, begin with prayer. Uh, I'm not there to take your prayer, prayer requests, so I invite you to share those with each other. You can pause this video, you can share those, um, or just lift them up silently as we do pray together. But would you please pray with me? And Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the fact that even though we're distant, even though we're far apart, we can be together. Uh, we can be together through your word. We thank you for your word in Genesis, your word in creation, your word in making us and uh, making us in your image and what all that means. We thank you for your presence with us, that you hear our requests, those that may be spoken out loud, those that we carry on our hearts. But Father, we thank you that you know the different situations we're walking through. You see them, you hear those requests, that you are present in them, that you are working in them. You work all things together for your glory, for the good of those who love you. Um, so we lift up those that we name in our hearts at this time, those that we name out loud. And we place them in your tender and loving care. In your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. So as we are, uh, we continue on in Genesis chapter 1. I invite you to flip to Genesis chapter 1. In the last few weeks, we have blazed through exactly 25 verses. Um, so we're setting a record here, but that's all right, because they have been full verses um, and that means that also the review of those verses will not take very long. Because as you remember, the last few weeks we've been walking through creation, the beginning of the creation story at least. And we kind of held up these two different categories. We had the category on one side of forming and the category on the other side of filling. Days one through three, as God forms kind of the substance, the things of the universe. And then days four through six, as God fills those. And so we have light and darkness formed, filled with the heavenly bodies, the stars, the sun, the moon, all those things. We have the sky formed and then the sky filled with the birds and the animals that live within the, uh, the sky and the seas. And then on day four or day three, we have land um, and day, day six, we have all the land creatures, uh, the things that crawl across the ground, livestock, animals, anything that lives on dry land. And as we ended last time, we pointed out that there is one key component missing within this story of Genesis so far, within this telling of Genesis so far. That story is, or that component is, what we have been building up to. Genesis chapter 1 really is structured in such a way with these days of forming, these days of filling, that it really comes up to the pinnacle the pinnacle of creation, the most important part of creation, you might say, the reason for creation. And we see that as we flip to Genesis 1, verse 26. We read together. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so the pinnacle of creation is laid out for us right there. The pinnacle of creation is mankind. And it's important here to make a distinction that there is no distinction really made between man and woman. God creates them both, man and woman, for a reason, for a purpose. And he creates both man and woman in his image in his likeness. The question is, what exactly does that mean? And there are various answers that have been put forward. A lot of people who are a lot smarter than me have spent a lot more time thinking upon that question. What does it mean that we are made in the image of God? Um, and some different theories have come forward. Does it mean that we look like God? Well, God is spiritual, so does that mean we have a spiritual component to us? Is that what he's trying to communicate? Does it mean we have the characteristics of God, of love, of mercy, of forgiveness, of all of these things? Um, does it mean that we actually look like God with eyes, with mouth, with ears, with all of these things? What exactly is the image of God? What does it mean that we bear the image of God? Ultimately, what it comes down to is we can't say with 100% certainty what this means, but we do know that God has created us in a special way. 
he has made us separate from the rest of creation because the rest of creation is not described in this way. God creates, God speaks all of creation, all of the universe into existence, but he doesn't place on them his image in the same way that he places his image on mankind. And so he places his image on man and woman. And verse 27 there um, really is structured in such a way that it emphasizes man and woman. It's very poetic. It's highly poetic, especially within the Hebrew. Um, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. The focus really is on God as creator, mankind as creature, but mankind also having an important part within creation, really being the pinnacle of creation. What is the purpose of that? We get to see that as we continue on in Genesis 1, uh, verse 28 here. says, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So we see all of the rest of creation is now put under the dominion of mankind. Or another way to put that is mankind is given authority over the rest of creation. So is that part of what it means to be in the image of God, to be created in his image, to be created with authority, with rule, with power? Yes, given to us by God, uh, but given to us with a mandate to rule over, to be good stewards of his creation. Another possibility that's often put forward, another possibility that is um, absolutely plausible. But the truth is that we are put here for a purpose. We are put here for a reason to be good stewards of God's creation, um, but also be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth um, so that we can be good stewards of the earth all over it, not just in one place. So we continue on reading verse 29. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. The question now becomes, um, so we look at creatures, we look at animals, we look at things like lions and tigers and bears, oh my, and all these creatures uh, that we know are carnivorous, that eat meat. Um, and yet here it's not said anything about that. Instead, exactly the opposite is said, that God has given them every plant in order to eat. And so why did God create them in such a way that they have the teeth, they have the, the uh, capabilities in order to eat meat if they were supposed to only eat plants? We get to that in just a little bit. We get into that in Genesis chapter 3. So I'll hold off on that for just a minute. Um, but just know that in the beginning, in the original creation, uh, the, we were vegetarians. Uh, people were vegetarians. Animals were vegetarians as well. And I think I pointed out before, but uh, the early chapters of Genesis, they really do echo, they really do strongly point to the ending chapters of Revelation, where we get to see this somewhat repeated. We get to see the lion laying down with the lamb. We get to see the lion eating straw like the ox. And so we get to see kind of this reversion, or we might say restoration of the created order, um, the way that things were supposed to be, that there is no death, there is no killing. Rather, God has provided food and sustenance through the plants that he has given over the face of the earth. And then verse 31, as we end out uh, chapter 1 within Genesis, God saw, God looked upon, God looked down from heaven or into his creation, however you want to say that. Um, but God saw all that he had made, and it was not just good, it was very good. There was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. So in six days, we see all of creation now not just good, but very good. God has completed his work and his work is now very good. It is whole. And so we see that within verse, uh, within Genesis chapter two, we always say that and we always point out that those um, divisions within your Bible of verses of chapters, they are added in later. They are not inspired. And so sometimes you can ignore them. This is one place where I think you should ignore the division between chapter one and chapter two, maybe move that down two verses um, as we get to see kind of the conclusion of this creation narrative. Um, in the beginning of chapter two it says, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And if you think about heavens and earth, 
Don't think just of the heavens that we can see and the earth that we know. Uh, we think of and we know all the universe, all of creation is finished within these six days. And we're still trying to figure out, and we're still trying to understand, and we're still discovering new planets, new galaxies, new solar systems, new edges of the universe, if you want to point that. We have no concept for the vastness of what God has created. And yet within six days, he's finished that creation. He has called it very good. And so, verse 2 of chapter 2, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is where we get to see, yes, the completion of creation, the end of creation, the end of the work that God had began within creation. But we also get to see that structuring of the week, that structuring of the way that we operate of seven day week, six days of work, one day of rest. Um, we also get to see that within the Jewish calendar that the Sabbath is not Sunday as we come to know it, but the Sabbath is Saturday um, within their reckoning because you begin your work week on the first day of the week on Sunday. You end your work week with the Sabbath, with the day of rest, with Saturday. And so we get to see the end of the first accounts of creation. The reason I say it that way is because Genesis chapter 2 holds another count, uh, account of creation, one that we have to struggle with. We have to answer this question because now we have two accounts of creation that are held up side by side within Scripture. How do we reconcile these two? How do we speak to these two accounts of creation? How can we see what looks like separate accounts and yet they're both within uh, scripture. They're both the narrative of how God created the heavens and the earth. And so as we walk through the rest of Genesis chapter 2, and this is why I, I kind of said um, that division should probably be moved down a few verses. You move that division down to verse 4 as being the beginning of chapter 2, and we get to see that sharp delineation, that sharp change almost in the tone of Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 2. I kind of pointed out as we were walking through Genesis chapter 1, it's highly stylized, it's highly poetic, it's very easy to remember. Um, even if I asked you now to pause the video and go back and lay out the days of creation, you could do so. Um, you could say the three days of forming, the three days of filling. You could say how God created man and woman. You could probably quote almost verbatim even that poem um, that in the, his image he created them, in the image of God he created them, man and woman he created them. Um, very easy to remember. And so one of the theories that is put forward is that Genesis chapter 1 is kind of the oral tradition that has been handed down throughout time. And Genesis chapter 2 then uh, might be kind of the tradition that is handed directly to Moses by God during the wilderness wanderings in that way. Um, that brings to question, okay, so which one is true, which one is false? Do they have contradictory information? Do they contradict each other in any way? We'll talk about it. We'll get there. Um, but as we begin within Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 4, um, it begins with these words that become key for us in our understanding of Genesis. It says, this is the account. And I want you to pay attention every time those words pop up. This is the account. Because those words will signal a change for us. Genesis can really be broken into 10 portions or 10 um, divisions, 10 sections, if you want to put that put it that way. Um, and every time we see that phrase, this is the account that signals to us we're kind of entering into a new section of Genesis. So we get to see that here in Genesis 2-4. This is the account. Okay, with the account of what? Of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Okay, maybe they already have been created. Who knows? Let's take a look. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens... And no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plants of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And so a few things to point out within um, this section of verses First is the change of the divine name. And I brought this forward in the introductory material in that very first section of Genesis. But just to refresh your memory a little bit, there is this theory that we have four different sources 
for Genesis and how it comes to us in the present day. Um, the one being kind of that oral tradition, kind of that Moses wrote that portion. Then we have um, what we call the Yahwistic tradition. Um, and this is what we get to see within Genesis chapter 2 here. If you look in Genesis 1, whenever God is referenced, it's referenced simply as God. Whereas in Genesis chapter 2, we get to see the Lord God, the divine name Yahweh here being translated into English. And so the thought is that maybe um, this is the note or the change or the way that we can see a different author, a different person is bringing forward this information. It's coming from a different source. Could that be the case? Could be. Um, yes, that Genesis chapter 1 is kind of that oral tradition. Genesis chapter 2 then is kind of that um, direct revelation that Moses got after the divine name is given. Um, we have to say that because it is after the divine name, Yahweh, um, is given at the burning bush. And so this must be written sometime after Moses lived. But could God have revealed his name to the people that were writing Genesis beforehand or handing that down to his people beforehand? Absolutely. So ultimately, we don't know. We kind of stick with the tradition of the church that Moses wrote Genesis. And so Moses probably wrote this portion of Genesis as well. Um, but it is a distinct feature of the text that uh, I do want to point out to you. And, and you will encounter in discussions with other people as you talk about Genesis. The other portion of that then is um, kind of the seeming difference in the order of creation that we see in Genesis here. The seeming difference being... There's dry ground, but there's no shrubs. The trees, the plants, the animals, supposedly, haven't inhabited the land yet. And yet, before those things take place, it says God makes mankind. So what do we do with that? Um, how, do we, how do we kind of reconcile these two accounts of um, creation? Saying that in one account, dry land is there, but the, the plants haven't sprung up and given life. And now all of a sudden we have mankind. It seems like we've skipped some days from Genesis 1 to Genesis 2. Um, and a couple different ways have been put forward to try and explain that. Uh, one way is to simply say that the plants are there. They simply haven't grown. And as you look at what we've just read, it does say, yes, um, the plants are there. The seeds are there. But God hasn't caused the rain to fall yet so that they haven't grown yet. Okay, that's one way we can look at it. Um, but that does kind of say in Genesis chapter 1, God caused to grow all the green things of the earth. He filled the earth with the plants. He gave them every tree for their food. Um, so is that a contradiction? Is it really not a contradiction? Uh, I kind of err on the side of saying it's not a contradiction. Uh, we don't know exactly at what point God caused things to grow to their full height, to their full length um, in that way, in that shape. But really what's not important here isn't that the plants and the trees and all of that hasn't grown. What's important is the extra detail we get on the formation of mankind, on the creation of mankind. And we get to see even more highlighted, even more stressed, that mankind is the pinnacle of creation. Because up until this point, um, I ask you the question, and it's a pretty straightforward answer. How has God created? Well, he spoke. He's created through the word. He's created through his voice. Whereas here in Genesis chapter 2, we see God actually entering into his creation. God stooping down into the dust, the things of the earth, taking from the earth, taking from his creation, shaping and forming and molding mankind, and then breathing into him the breath of life. That breath of life is something in the Hebrew called the nephesh, um, often translated spirit, often translated life force, maybe um, it simply stands for that which animates a body, that which gives you animation, that which gives you life, whatever that might be. Um, but it highlights the significance that nothing else has been formed in this way. Nothing else has been formed with God's own hands, and nothing else has specifically been given the breath of life in the way that mankind has been given the breath of life, that God was there and present and intimately involved in the creation of mankind. And this just stresses more and more that mankind really is the pinnacle, the focus of the creation act of what God is doing. Um, and really the pinnacle and the focus of the rest of the narrative is God's acts on behalf of mankind. That's what not only Genesis speaks of, but all of scripture speaks about 
God has created the pinnacle of his creation. He has created mankind. Now he's going to redeem mankind. Now he's going to work for the salvation of mankind. And so we continue on, Genesis 2, 8. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. We stop right there. We say, oh, where's the Garden of Eden? I want to go check it out. I want to see where the Garden of Eden is. Uh, the answer is we really don't know. <laughs> we have some good guesses. We can make some educated guesses from the information that follows. Um, but ultimately, we don't know. Um, and it's probably best that we don't know because mankind was cast out. Mankind was declared not able to enter into Eden. Um, and so maybe that's why the location is veiled from us. We're not exactly sure. Um, all that we know is... God placed man in a specific place for a specific reason, for a specific purpose. So God places man in Eden. There he put man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So why did God create these two trees? What makes these trees special? What makes them different? The tree of life, um, seemingly self-explanatory, that you eat this tree, you continue on into life. You continue on into eternal life. There is no death when you eat from this tree. And then the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, again, pretty self-explanatory, um, knowing the will of God, knowing or having your own will and being able to go opposed to the will of God. And so the question arises, um, all the time, why did God create the tree? Why did God make it possible for us to sin? Why didn't God just make us sinless and not even give us the option to sin? And the question um, sometimes gets answered in saying, well, God wanted agents of free will. He didn't want robots. He wanted um, people that would choose to love him and people that could choose to hate him. Because if you could choose to hate him, then you can choose to love him. We see that logic playing out a little bit. You have to have a choice in order to make the right choice. But we know from the rest of the story, we know from the rest of scripture, mankind from the very beginning doesn't make the right choice. We choose to make ourselves God. We choose to try and be like God instead of to keep God in his place as creator, as God, as, we're, as the ruler of our lives. And so the question then is, okay, if God put the, the tree in the garden, if God is all-knowing, if God is all-power, he must have known even before creation that mankind would eat from this tree, would sin, would fall away from him. The answer to that is yes, absolutely. God knew what would happen. It's not like Jesus was plan B. It's not like Jesus was blindsided by the actions of Adam and Eve and all of a sudden he had to panic and struggle and come up with some way to redeem mankind. No, that's not the case at all. God is outside of time. God is eternal. God knew what would happen in the Garden of Eden. So why did he create? The answer comes when we focus on the reason that we have Scripture. When we focus on what Scripture tells us. When we focus on the subject of Scripture. And hence, spoilers, the subject of Scripture primarily is not you. It's not me. It's not even really creation. The subject of Scripture, the primary focus of Scripture, is God. It's the revelation of God to his creation, specifically to mankind. And it's the revelation of God's love, of God's redeeming work, of God's sacrifice on behalf of his creation. And so the answer to why did God create this garden? Why did God create the tree? Why did God create the possibility for sin, if you want to put it that way? Um, the whole reason, the whole purpose is so God could reveal himself to mankind. So God could reveal himself as the loving, redeeming, and forgiving, and merciful God that we know him to be. So we continue going on um, within chapter 2, verse 10 here. It says, A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah. Where there is gold, the gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gahan. It winds through the, winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigeris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And so we're given kind of the boundaries or at least um, 
kind of an idea of where the Garden of Eden is located with these headwaters. Um, as we go back through history, as we go back through geography and look for these places, the first two rivers that are mentioned here, um, Pishon that winds through Hivala, and the second one being Gihon or Gihon, um, we don't know where those rivers are. <laughs> we just, we've lost the records. We're not exactly sure where those waters are. Uh, maybe they're named something else now, and we just don't know when that name was changed. Maybe they've changed entirely and they no longer exist. We're not sure. Uh, we do know where the Tigerius and the Euphrates rivers are. Uh, we do know kind of the land that they're within, Mesopotamia, kind of around that area, Canaan, the Promised Land, uh, things of that nature. Uh, basically, modern Iraq and Iran in that area is kind of where we think the Garden of Eden uh, may have been. That's our best guess. Ultimately, does it matter? No, not really. Um, but this is just kind of a, a fun fact that we can look into within the, the creation account within Genesis and say, all right, well, um, this is one possibility about where the Garden of Eden could have been. As we continue on, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So take note here really quickly. In the Garden of Eden, before sin has entered the world, God has placed mankind in the garden for a purpose to take care of the garden, to be a steward of the garden so that it would flourish and grow. Does mankind have work to do before the fall? Yes, is the answer. Um, so the question sometimes gets asked is, okay, so what are we going to do in heaven? What are we going to do after Jesus comes back? What is eternity going to look like for us? And my answer would be, well, what does life without sin look like? What does life in the presence of God look like? As we continue on in Genesis, we get to see Adam and Eve in the presence of God, walking with him and talking with him and being with him. But we also see Adam and Eve are given work. They're given a purpose. They're given a job. And so this is just me thinking this isn't biblical truth. This isn't said anywhere within scripture. This is just me um, kind of formulating a hypothesis, but one that makes sense, I think, um, that in, in eternity, we're going to continue to have jobs. We're going to continue to have vocations. We're going to continue to have callings. The difference being those callings are no longer marred by sin. They're no longer affected by sin. Rather, we're able to work at them fully and completely to the glory of God. Um, as the scriptures speak, whatever we do, work at it as if working for God, not for man. That will be fully realized within eternity um, as we dwell in the presence of God, as we work for him, and as we work to love our neighbor. Um, so eternity isn't just floating up on the clouds, strumming our harps and singing songs. No, we'll have stuff to do. We will have purpose. We will have meaning. Um, it just won't look like anything that we know now. Work will become something different. And we get to see this redefined. We get to see work redefined a little bit within chapter 3 uh, whenever we do get there. Um, but we'll touch on that when we do get there. So God gives them the Garden of Eden. He places them in the Garden of Eden. And he tells them to take care of it. And verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man. He gives man a command. It is not a decision. It is not a you can pick. No, he tells them, this is what you are supposed to do. He commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. We know how that story goes. We'll walk through it in just a little bit. Um, we'll see it. But what's interesting to me and what I've just realized, and I, I don't know why it took me so long to realize, but just in the last few weeks, what is left out in that description? What is left out in that command? God says, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because on the day that you do, you'll surely die. There's another tree. <laughs> There's another tree mentioned in the garden, placed there specifically by God, that being the tree of life. Mankind is not commanded not to eat from the tree of life. It's simply the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they're commanded not to eat from. So why is that? Why just one tree and not the other? Um, the thought being that mankind continuing on imperfection would be able to eat from the tree of life, would not experience death. That this is a blessing that God is giving to mankind. This is another place as well where we touch on the end of Revelation. 
And as we see Revelation, there are trees growing over the river in heaven. One of those trees is the tree of life, the tree that bears fruit 12 times a year, uh, all the time, we would say, in every season. The tree of life is ever giving. The river of life is ever flowing. Um, so we get to see that mankind, yes, does get to eat up from the tree of life. It's not yet um, because we made a choice. We followed uh, our own hearts instead of the commands of God. Verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. And so we get a little bit of the answer to the question, um, does Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 have a contradiction within them? Do they contradict each other? And here we would kind of say the evidence suggests probably not, actually. Um, we get to see mankind is formed, mankind is placed, mankind is given a word, and that brings every creature that he has already formed to Adam in order to name them. And so is there that contradiction between one and two? No, I don't think so. I don't think scripture really has a contradiction. It's just laid out in a different way, I'm not in the highly stylized format of chapter one, rather more in a narrative format here in chapter two of saying God created mankind, God gave mankind work, God realized, not realized, but acknowledged that mankind was alone, and so God gave man work. The work of, yes, tending to the garden, but also the work, the responsibility, the exercising of his authority over creation in naming those things of creation, and naming the beasts of the land, and naming the birds of the air, of all of these things. And as he goes throughout that process, mankind, God reveals to mankind, his special place within creation. Because out of all the creatures that have been created, mankind stands alone. No suitable helper, no suitable person, no suitable um, creation can come alongside mankind to be his equal, to be there with him, to be there for him. And so what does God have to do? Let's answer that question. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the, lib, from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. And so we see God creating woman now, from the very flesh, from the bones of man, from the bones and flesh of Adam, creating woman, creating someone to be beside him, creating someone to help him, equal in that they are both the pinnacle of creation. They both inhabit the breath of life. They both have that place um, of dominion, of authority, of power within creation, um, but also separate. Man and woman are different creatures, different creations, given different purposes, and blessed in different ways. And so now we get into the talk of, okay, well, why is man uh, one way? Why is woman another way? Especially as we get into the church. Um, we had the readings last time about man and woman. And what does Paul permit man to do in the church? What does he permit women to do in the church? All of these different things. Um, when we get right down to it, we simply have to say man and woman are created different. They are both created. They are both loved the same by God but are given different characteristics, are given different personalities, are given different strengths, different weaknesses, different roles within creation. So mankind is created to work. Women are created to assist within that, to be a helper, to be a helpmate. Mankind is created then to love the woman, to care for the woman in the same way that he loves and cares for creation. Remember, sin hasn't entered the world yet. The world is perfect. And so in a perfect world, this works perfectly together with man and woman caring for each other, supporting each other, lifting each other up, complimenting each other, not saying you're pretty and you look handsome, 
but rather complementing each other within their roles in creation and fulfilling their roles within creation. If you want a really bad joke, um, in, the, in the English at least, um, you take a look at what Adam says. As Adam is presented with woman for the first time, God brings Eve into the presence of Adam, and uh, you can only imagine Adam's face as he looks at Eve, and he goes, whoa, man, woman, that's what we'll call her. Uh, okay, all right, you can grumble along, terrible joke, all that, I got that. Um, and I'm going to leave you with that. I'm going to leave you with the terrible joke. We're at about 35 minutes, um, so I encourage you, um, if this is Tuesday morning, I encourage you um, to go about your day, blessed day, serving those kids, um, being in those classrooms, lifting up your prayers, being in conversation with each other. Look forward to your travels up here um, in just a day or so um, as you make your way up to Daytona for that conference. If this is Wednesday, uh, take this time maybe to share some prayer requests with each other to be in a time of prayer, also to be in a time of community. Um, but whichever class you're viewing this in, um, do take some time if you have questions to write those questions down. Either keep them in your Bible, write them down. You can ask them to me next week as I'm back with you all. We will have regular Bible study next week as well, so we'll be there um, to answer questions in that way. Or you can shoot, shoot me an email throughout the week. I'll be able to respond to those as we get back from Daytona um, and hopefully give you a decent, at least, response to that. Um, but from there, uh, we will continue on with the narration of the fall next time, Genesis chapter 3. Uh, I hope you have a blessed rest of the week. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.